Ladies and gents, welcome to this Thursday's GeoTalk. It's fantastic to see you all in the audience here on Zoom, but also on YouTube Live as well. So thank you for joining us. And of course, thank you to the CCIC group uh, for sponsoring these online GeoTalks. We appreciate it very, very much. Uh, so today we have a very interesting topic relevant to many people in our community here in Southern Africa. And this is a talk by Shuyang Meng, who is currently a postdoctoral fellow from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. And he received a Bachelor of Science and an MSc degree from China University of Geosciences in Beijing, and then started his PhD program uh, at the University of Alberta in Canada. And he has graduated recently in the last few months. So congratulations, Xu Meng, uh, Xuyang, and, uh, and and thank you so much for joining us. It's really great to have you. As you will see in this talk, his focus is on investigating Precambrian porphyry copper systems and the nature of the magmatism that causes that mineralization. And I've had the pleasure of working with uh, Xu Yang in the hive deposit um, in Namibia over the last few years and, and working with him on that deposit. So uh, we're going to hear about that deposit as well as some other deposits from around the world. So Xu Yang, over to you. Thank you for this. Uh, I'm going to mute myself and you can share your screen and I'll stop sharing. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Grant. I will share a slide. Can you see here? Yes, we can see your slides and they are now full screen. So over to you, Chiang. Thank you. Okay, yep. Yeah. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Xuyang and uh, it's my pleasure to give the presentation at Wits University. I visited Wits University three years ago uh, at that time. So we are we were starting a project on the hype deposit, and uh, I did some field work after visiting the Wits University. And uh, now we meet again, and uh, but online. That's uh, thanks to COVID nineteen. And as a grant introduced, I graduated uh, from uh, Lawrence University in Canada in June of the 2021, this year, and as a PhD. Um, I'm now working as a postdoc fellow at the University of Michigan, working with Adam Simon. And uh, in this talk, I would like to introduce some of my PhD research that and uh, summarize the main findings that I've obtained during the past few years. <clears throat> so the title of this talk is Magmatic Controls on Formation of Some Representative Arkin to Peter Protozoic Porphyry type carbon gold deposit. So porphyry carb systems are the um, system is the is the most one of the most important mineral system in the world, and it can, they contribute about three quarters of copper and one quarter of gold to the world, and uh, it involves uh, many several deep, uh, several type of deposits such as a porphyry deposit, scar deposit, thermal deposits, and other type of deposits. So all these deposits are related to the magmatic hydrothermal fluid dissolved from an underlying magma chamber. So the focus of this study is a porphyry carbon deposit. So porphyry carbon deposit has a disseminated and valent mineralization that are generally associated with potassium alteration. So that developed uh, that developed uh, alterate zoning from potassium alteration to chloride satisfied alteration to perbolated alteration. So the key features is that potassium aeration is commonly associated with the disseminated valent mineralization. So this is the main features that we used to identify the whether a deposit is a porphyry type deposit in the Precambrian, because in Precambrian, maybe some erosion, some zonings of the alteration have been eroded or modified. Another key features of the porphyry car deposit, it's a shadow emplacement generally below the pedal surface, about two or five kilometers. So this key features, feature of the deposit uh, affect us to understand this figure. From these figures, you can see most of the porphyry carb deposits are formed in the Phenozoic, and they are very rare in Precambrian. So what we don't know is whether the rarity of the porphyry carb deposit in the Precambrian is caused by erosion loss or unfavorable tectonal magmatic setting. <coughs> So what type of tectonic magmatic setting th that is a favorable for porphyry carbon deposit formation? From these uh, figures, we can see most of the porphyry carbon deposits 
formed along the subduction zones or arc related settings, such as the collision related settings. And uh, this relationship is not only spatial, but also genetically. That's a, because the porphyry carboids are commonly re, uh, exclusively associated with the moderately oxidized and volatile rich magma. Such magmas are sub, uh, typical features of the subduction zones. In subduction zones, subduction slab can transport oxidized material from earth surface to the mantle. Dehydration of the oceanic crust can release relatively oxidized fluids to meet some metallized mantle wedge to produce to trigger partial melting and uh, produce the basaltic melt and the plating at the base of the crust. It experienced the Martian process in the Martian zones that is melting assimilation storage homogenization to produce the andesitic melt upper rise to the upper crustal level to form magma collect in the magma chamber. So upper cooling of the magma chamber, there will have a large volume of the magmatic horizontal fluids and these fluids can take metal from the magma chamber to form porphyry carbon deposits at an epic part of the, uh, sorry, from the magma chamber to form porphyry carbon deposits at the epic part of this uh, magma chamber. So if the magma chamber are depleted in the carbon and the gold, the all forming potential of the magma chamber to form porphyry carbon deposits will be reduced. So well, in what conditions that the carbon and the gold in the magma chamber will be relatively low? From the right figure, you can see surface species in the melt is mainly affected by the oxygen scarcity. In the relatively oxidized melt, the sulfur is mainly sulfate. And in the relatively reduced melt, the sulfur is mainly sulfite. So in the relatively reduced melt, and uh, there we, it, it can easily trigger the large volume of the sulfite saturation. Copper and gold, such as chelfile and sulfile elements, will be compatible with the sulfite and will be depleted during the magma uprising. So if the source are very reduced or some the melt assimilates some uh, reduced material, they will trigger the sulfide saturation and uh, further reduce the carbon and gold content in the magma chamber, for, um, chamber. So the unforming potential will be also reduced. So in the two conditions, the relatively reduced source or the relatively reduced material in the during the magma ascent, and these conditions most likely formed in the Precambrian in comparison to Phenozoic. It compared to the high marine sulf sulfate content and relatively oxidized iron species of the submarine basalt. In most era of the Precambrian, the submarine sulfate contents are re relatively low. The iron species of the submarine basalt will be rarely reduced. Recycling or subduction of this material from Earth's surface to the mantle may not be able to release the relatively oxidized fluids to meet a somatized mantle wedge. So, further, to cannot be able to produce relatively oxidized source. So, this uh, can ex this hypothesis can explain why the porphyry carbon deposits are relatively rare in the Precambrian. But uh, please note that there is a few deposits have been reported in the Precambrian. And uh, what we want to know is whether the similar metallogenic processes for phenozoic porphyry carbon deposits also operated in the Precambrian. Resolving these problems has been hindered by lacking a reliable quantitative measurement of the redox states and the volatile elements of balance for consort of magmas associated with the rare reported Precambrian porphyry carbon deposits. So that's a, one of the most important reasons for lacking of the, such a measurement is because during the protracted time, extensive metamorphism deformation and alteration may occur. So the primary features of the rocks, particularly in the mineralogy, have been modified. It's, it's very hard to estimate the oriental composition and the, the intensity parameters such as redox state. So to test whether metallogenic processes for phenozoic porphyry carbon system are also operating in the precambrian, or whether the KG dynamic or geochemical difference reduce the fertility of precambrian magmas. So in my PhD thesis, uh, I focus to study three locations, deposit in from the three locations. So I started my PhD project in the, at the Tonghui deposit in China. But unfortunately, we didn't find the cross magma chamber for the mineralization, although the deposit uh, 
yield its uh, typical features such as a disseminated valent mineralization that associates with fire height K3 spout duration. That's a typical feature for porphyry carbonate. So in this talk, I would like to introduce the research on the high deposit and the a few deposits that are from IPTB crystal belt. So before I start introducing my, my results, uh, our results, I would like to introduce the oxygen frequency, the oxygen parameter we will use in the study. Because in the next two chapters, I will extensively introduce the results of the oxygen frequency. <clears throat> oxygen frequency is measures the pressure pressures of oxygen in the melt. And uh, generally we use a different uh, redox buffers to calibrate FO2 value. This uh, oxygen gas FO2 value um, using this redox buffer. And uh, such as FMQ, so ferrite, magnetite, cools, and uh, hematite, magnetite, and uh, nickel nickel oxide. And uh, in this study, we will use FMQ redox buffer to calibrate the FO2 value. So in this study, we also use uh, several methods. And uh, the first, uh, the most common method is a zircon cerium titanium uranium oxygen parameter that was recently calibrated by Laos. Uh, this uh, research is uh, from Australia. And uh, he designed a method that uh, used the zircon geochemistry, the many cerium titanium uranium contents in the zircon. And uh, using this age corrected uranium contents to estimate the oxygen scarcity. This method is empirical method. It's mainly based on other oxygen parameters. And uh, another method is unfoldable oxygen parameter that was uh, calibrated um, um, a few years ago or several years ago. And uh, it's quite complex. But note, this is also, uh, they say it's empir exper experimental method, but uh, this element, uh, all this, most of the elements are not redox sensitive but uh, it uh, can give us some results to compare to uh, for internal comparison. And uh, the third method that we use is a server in apt parameter that we collaborate, uh, collaborate with the uh, Adam Simon group uh, when I was a PhD student. And uh, this method use the sulfur species in the appetite and uh, use the uh, values to estimate the oxygen frequency. And also two additional methods that is a magnetite human oxygen parameter. And uh, this mineral pairs can well be uh, preserved in the volcanic rocks. But we found some uh, uh, mineral pair in the plutonic rocks and give us some uh, high results may suggest the uh, redox um, oxygen frequency values for the later stages of the magma crystallization. So also we use uh, the, some petrol a lot of petrographic coast evidence, such as uh, the assemblage of the titanite, magnetite, and coarse pair. So it can help us to constrain the minimal minimum uh, values of the oxygen frequency. So let's start. I introduced the four, two parts. The first part is about the research on the hybrid deposit in the Namibia. Hybrid deposit in Namibia, uh, it's located in the southern Namibia. It's quite close to South Africa. And uh, the title of this part we, is uh, oxidized sulfur rich arc magmas from the porphyry carbon deposits by 1.88 billion years. Before we conducting, uh, conducted the research, we, we didn't know so whether it's oxidized sulfur rich magmas that typically, uh, the typical for phenozoic subduction zones have uh, formed in the Precambrian. <clears throat> That's uh, why we um, give this title for this uh, paper, we have published uh, these papers in the Nature Communication. And the uh, high body deposit is uh, mainly hosted by the grand diorite and look dynamite grand diorite. And uh, it's surrounded by the basalis of the via strip suite. It's uh, many grand diorites, mosaic, tonlite, and some uh, diorite, and also the uh, mafic and, uh, and ultra mafic rocks, but gable dominant. And this uh, will, will strip the suite and uh, intrude the Orange River group. And uh, we collect samples of the andesite and the field seed tuff. And uh, these rocks predate the mineralization. The main, from this cross section map, we can see the main mineralizations, mainly hosted by the Grand Diorite Porphyry and Luke Grand Diorite Porphyry. And the main type of alteration is vital alteration. And uh, some are uh, overprinted by the chloride. Um, it's um, we don't know exactly whether the chloride formed by the hydrothermal overprintings 
uh, at the same stages of the porphyry carbon uh, uh, mineral mineralization. All it's uh, caused by the later stages of the uh, metamorphism uh, formed at about 1.1 billion years. But uh, the main uh, alteration type we can recognize is the biotite and also some epithelite. And the main type of the veinlet is a dark, early dark micaceous vein. And uh, you can see the map here. And uh, this uh, type of veins contributes the majority of the mineralization. From these uh, figures, you can see the high upper deposits here is the uh, typical features of the full porphyry carbon deposits, such as the disseminated and valent mineralization associated with the biotite and some abidot alteration. And also the vein type, you can see the early dark micaceous vein and also some coarse vein, it's a type of coarse vein sinuous feature and also D vein. But uh, from this figure, you can also see the course, the A type of vein and D type of vein, and some uh, minor, minor occurrences of local occurrences of the B type of vein contribute limitedly to the mineralization. And the main mineralizations are mainly contributed by the early dark communications vein. Based on the knowledge that the high deposit is a porphyry carbon deposit, we use uh, two different methods, like a uh, laser ablation ICD mass, CI teams, teams methods to date the ages of the pre mineralization rocks, such as anisotropic porphyry and uh, rally a few cuff, and also same mineral mineralizations rocks, such as a uh, host the mineral rocks host the mineralization, such as a diorite, uh, 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 sorry, grand diorite porphyry, look granite porphyry, and uh, the same rocks with the same age, grand diorite porphyry and diorite, and also the post post mineralizations applied dike. So we use this result constrain the timing of the mineralization to about 1.88 billion years. So the age is consistent with the UPB age, the real lead age of the hydrothermal root hell that are associated with the calcopyrite. So we want to further understand the oxygen efficacy, um, whether the magmas are oxidized or suffer rich. We use a three different methods for this study. And we use a zircon geochemistry using the sulfur in aptite species and also some um, local occurrence of the magnetite, uh, titanite, and uh, quartz like assemblage. The quartz is not included in the figure, but is that, that are very common in the same section. So the earliest minerals, um, one of the earliest minerals is aptite, and we we use the synchrotron methods to measure the surface species in the aptite. And you can see from the spectra that nearly all the sulfur in the aptite is mainly in sulfate, suggesting the crystallization of the aptite in a relatively oxidized environment. We further use re relevant oxygen parameter, such as sulfur in aptite oxygen parameter, zircon oxygen parameter, and also the, this, uh, also the assemblage to constrain the oxygen efficiency. So the two methods, sulfur in aptite and the zircon geochemistry, these two methods, are consistent, but the zircon result from the zircon geochemistry has a large uncertainty here. This result also consistent with the minimum constraint of the oxygenicity by the titanite maintained the coarse buffer. So these results are comparable to phenozoic arc magmas and magmas associated with the phenozoic buffer carbon And the oxygenicity are generally at above FMQs plus one to FMQs plus two. We also analyze the sulfur content in the aptite inclusion hosted by the zircon and the titanite. And uh, we, you can see from the left figures, uh, the aptite sulfur content for the high magma uh, are consistent with uh, those for the phenozoic arc magmas and magmas associated with phenozoic porphyry carbon points. Aptite sulfur content is mainly affected by the mild sulfur content, oxygen scarcity, and the temperature. The oxygen scarcity, as we constrained in the previous slide, and also the temperature we calculate using the aptite saturation, saturation temperature, are consistent with the phenozoic arc magmas and magmas associated with phenozoic porphyry carbon deposits. And if so, we can argue that the magma for the um, the hybrid magma from which the aptites crystallized 
have a similar the merit sulfur content with the phenozoic arc magmas and the magmas associated with the phenozoic porphyry carbonate. In support of this argument, we use the two methods, and uh, these methods are internally consistent. And uh, this first method was was uh, designed by us to we consider all availables that uh, that uh, con conditions to affect them the appetite sulfur contents, including the oxygen gas, the, the merit sulfur contents, and also the temperature. So the second matter is from uh, this paper, and uh, the, we use the linear relationship of uh, the appetite sulfur contents with the merit sulfur contents and the temperature. So this result also supports that the high magma has a similar comparable sulfur contents with the uh, phenozoic arc magmas and magmas associated with the phenozoic of carbonate. So we know that high magmas are red oxidized and uh, sulfur rich, and uh, they are comparable to phenozoic arc magmas. And we want to further know where, how the magma become oxidized. Previous studies suggest garnet fractionation is uh, one of the factors that for magma auto oxidation. And uh, we use a uh, research geochemistry data from the right figure, you can see the literature chemistries suggest a literic real element pattern with a negative European anomaly. So this suggests unfoldable on the project cost fractionation. And this is also supported by the hyperosteums terbiums ratio, negative relationship of this ratio with the acidic content. And it suggests the source that are very shallow and the garden fractionation may not be main factor for the magma of the high in the hive to be oxidized. And we also analyze the zircon half in oxygen isotope to constrain the source. The narrow range of the half in isotope suggests a homogeneous magmatic source. And in the increased granular rocks from the basilisk, most analyses are located in the mantle value uh, range, the range for the mantle zircon, oh, sorry, and we will few analyzes of this. So it suggests that its main is a mental main derived source with a minorly minor cross contamination. The narrow range half in my stop and the rarity of uh, the lacking of the xenoplast zircon suggests a minimum cross assimilation during the magma acid. So the first the fraction name is another main factor for the magma to be oxidized, and the, during the magma acid, they will have a minimal cross assimilation. It's reasonable to argue that the source may have been oxidized, rarely oxidized, and uh, may have been rarely uh, ox oxidized. So the values may not be comparable to the value we have, uh, we have estimated, but it's uh, in the range of the moderate oxidized range, uh, oxidized uh, source range. So we would like to. Uh, give some uh, interpretation. From this figure, you can see the summary by salt uh, remains reduced. And uh, the sulfur content, uh, if, if this uh, material cannot be contributed to some oxidized fluids, the, the most plausible reasons may be the elevated marine sulfur content in at about 1.2.1 billion years. So recycling this material can also release some fluids, oxidized fluids, to metamatize the mantle wage to produce the relatively oxidized melt. And uh, nevertheless, this study suggests, demonstrates that a similar metallogenic processes for phenozoic porphyry carbon deposits have operated in the precambrian. That's the most important conclusions in this study. And after finishing the project in the hive, and the deposit, we want to know the weather in the arcane, such as a 2.7 billion years. There's also similar metagenic processes for phenozoic porphyry carbon deposits are required to form such a deposit. So we move to the older rocks and older deposits. Particularly in the arcane, the rock, the main rock type, are TDG, is a sodium enriched in comparison to the potassium enriched grandarite and granite in the upper continental crust rocks in the post arcane. So we would select a few deposits that are associated with the TDG rocks to start for study. So that's uh, uh, 
results from for part two and for part two and uh, the title of the part two is the variable modes of formation for tonalite, trondamite, grandarite, diorite related porphyritable cargo deposits in the Arkansas Abitibi crystal belt. The three deposits we select is a coated deposit and a crossout deposit and sea joint deposit. And uh, um, I, I would like to not use the select because in this area, this only a few deposits we can work on. And uh, this only a few deposits that have been reported to people for free type. And uh, in this area in IPTV crystal belt, you can see this area south of IPTV crystal belt. And the most area has been covered by volcanic rocks. Suggest erosion loss may not be the main factor for the rarity of the perfect carbon deposit in the area. And uh, we would like to know, we would, have to, would like to investigate the reason. Uh, in Abitibi crystal belt, the platonic rocks involved in a similar pattern to other cratons from the uh, sodium enriched tonalite, diorite, trondamite to grandiorite tonalite to potassium rich sonicitoid and alkaline intrusion to the latter stages of the S type rock uh, granite formed by the crust melting. And um, there, the, we can divide it in two stages of the, the dynamic setting for, uh, for the IBTB evolution. And uh, before about 2.695 billion years, and the, the, this IBTB grist belt experienced is interpreted to be experienced as a sodic short term subduction or plume arc interaction. The arc rock, uh, uh, the plume will form some uh, basalt that are quite uh, prevalent in the IPTV crystal belt, such as here, and also some right hand rocks. And after 2.695 billion years, and it experienced across the shortening and the many mountain stages, building stages. And this stage is, was interpreted to be caused by the subduction processes. And uh, uh, this process has to be also be evidenced, supported by the lithogy chemistry um, features of these rocks. It is suggests that these rocks has a, like a subduction zones magma feature, features for the subduction zones magma. And the three deposits we select and we will study, the coated gold deposits formed at about 2.74, and the sigil deposits formed at about 2.70, and cross deposits formed at about 2.69, and uh, these three deposits are were formed formed at two different type of setting, and may suggest as a different pedogenesis. The Cotico deposit is mainly hosted by the magmatic hydrothermal breacher that is uh, uh, related to the diorite intrusion, and uh, the predate the mineralization is the tonalite. It's original tonalite here. The main type of alteration is a bitter alteration, and uh, the it uh, associates with the disseminated and valent mineralization here. So this deposit contains a large amount of gold, but also geochemical significance, uh, but just undefined copper. Another deposit is a uh, sea joint deposit. Sea joint deposit is uh, hosted by the magmatic hydro breacher with the core of the trondamite. The trondamite is compositionally and uh, geochronologically similar to the trondamite of two phase from, from the, in the flavoring intrusion. So we argue that the core of the trondamite is a cosort of magma for the mineralization. And uh, the previous published and uh, our result suggests the age of the mineralization, uh, the age of the intrusion of the sigium trondamite is at about 2.70 billion years. And another deposit is a cross of breacher. The cross of breaches develop the uh, potassium alteration that associates with the disseminated valent mineralization. And this breacher also developed the chloride aeration. And this breacher is cross cut by the mineralized and key few sparse altered fuel spot porphyry. And this fuel spot porphyry was dated at the same age with the Clifford stock. So the Clifford stock was interpreted by the previous study to be the cosort of magma for the mineralization. So we collect the samples of tonalitic rocks from uh, this intrusion and also some uh, project geoclassophoric porphyry um, sample for study. So the coated gold and uh, the literature chemistry suggests the coated gold diorite yielded large uh, enrichment of the 
large unleashed file elements such as cesium, rubidium, rubarium, also slightly titanium spectrum anomaly, um, and so also a slightly like a depletion of the niobium titanium. And the predates and mineralization tonalite has a different geochemistry with uh, features and which is not a focus of this study. And the flavoring C. Jones transmite yielded the flat, flat uh, rear trace element, light, uh, trace element pattern and uh, also strontium phosphate and titanium depletion, suggesting the fractionation of the project class and uh, also some on iron, titanium oxides, and uh, aptite. So it also yields the negative European anomaly that is quite similar to the Cotic gold diorite. Uh, this result suggests the source for the magma are relatively shallow or the source um, are relatively unhydrous. And uh, Clifford Stoke, uh, the list of geochemistry data suggests enrichment of the large unleashed fire elements such as cesium, rubidium, and barium but there's no um, European monomaly. So this just uh, it's also the area the district uh, real, a real as element light, light and suggesting we have deep source of the magma or we have high we have features of the magma source of the magma. So this also supported them. the connection is unstable. So. So it's also supported by the common occurrence of the amphibole in the filicrist. Uh, in, the, in the tonalite and uh, also amphophilicrist in the project ferric porphyry. So we further analyze the zircon, oxygen, and alphenium isotope to um, investigate the source of the magma. So the cortical diorite and the tonalite the zircon oxygen ion values located in the mantle value range suggest it's a mantle derived source. And the uh, Clifford stock, most an analysis are located in the mantle value, but also a few analyses below this. It suggests a limited or some minor degrees of uh, high temperature fluid aeration with the magma chamber or during the or in the magma source. In comparison to all coated gold and uh, the click cross or clifford stock. The C. John transmite is the, the lowest oxygen zircon oxygen isotope value. So, in, even in comparison to the values for other transmite phases in the flavoring intrusion, so it suggests at the time of the C. John transmite formation and at the time of a C. John's deposit formation. The magma chamber had been extensively altered by the high temperature fluid. And this fluid may be meteoric water or seawater. And uh, considering this deposit formed in an area of the VMS camp, it's most like the seawater that have, may have been leached some metal from the surrounding volcanic rocks to replenish to the magma chamber for the further mineralization at a sea zone. And uh, I would like to introduce some results of the oxygen efficacy we have uh, uh, estimated. But before this, I want to um, introduce some uh, criteria we have used to identify the primary zircon amphibole and the appetite. The, we generally find uh, some uh, prime minerals as the phenocryst here. It's a rel relative fish. It's a uh, uh, texturally like uh, intact. And also some inclusion hosted by the appetite amphibole inclusion. And uh, you can see this, uh, this uh, grains is uh, here. And uh, the grains yield its oscillatory zonings, even it's not uh, quite uh, faint. And, uh, but it suggests the grains are magnetic. It preserves the primary feature. In comparison to the primary appetite, and in the same section, in a CL response, the outer appetite has a mosaic CL response, suggesting the fluid mediated alteration. And uh, we also try to identify some prim primary appetites hosted by the zircon. And uh, in the zircons, it's a representative figures. In the zircon, you can see there's two appetite inclusion. The left ones are relatively primary, but the right ones seem to have been altered by the hydrothermal fluids or have been metamorphosed. 
This is because in the zircon, there's a fracture here. This fracture may have played as conduit for the field fluid field infiltration. So that suggests that the CL response can help us to identify the primary or alter appetite that we have extensively used in our research to scan the thin section to find the primary appetite. We also find some uh, we also found some uh, meta amylase amino pair hosted by the plug class, but uh, the results suggest the meta amylase amino pair crystallized at a relatively low temperature, suggesting the results of the oxygenation from this amino pair may also record the results for the later stages of the magma crystallization. We will show the result in the next uh, few slides, and uh, this uh, re um, but uh, this result seems not be so reliable. From the zircon geochemistry and uh, the Clifford stock, the yearly the highest FO2 value of FMQs plus one to plus 1.5, and uh, the cortical diorite yield FO2 value of FMQs plus 1.7. And the uh, C. Jones transmite and the flavorin transmite, the values are scattered and the high uncertainty. So the high uncertainty and the stack scattered range of this value may be caused by the low abundance of the element involved in the oxygen parameter. And because it's low abundance, so you, the analysis will produce some uh, like a uh, high uncertainty. It will affect the results we have calculated using oxygen parameter. But the average value for the four samples are uh, generally at about f of f of two uh, FMQ values plus or minus zero. And uh, we also use unfavorable composition to estimate oxygen scarcity. And uh, from this figure, you can see the results for the Clifford tonalites and Clifford tonalic rocks and uh, at the values of uh, F2 values of FMQs 2.7 to 2.5. And the Cody Gold course diorite Yearly, the FO2 value of, of the FMQs plus about 1.7 to 1.5. Please note that unfavorable oxygen parameter was calibrated for volcanic rocks. And previous study that unfavorable composition from tonic rocks may overestimate the oxygen scarcity by one log unit. If we consider the one log unit difference and the after calibration, the values for the Clifford tonic rocks may about 1.7 to 1.5, and the cortic gold course diorite value is about 1.5. So these results are consistent with, with the results from the zircon geochemistry. So we further to use uh, appetite in a uh, surface in appetite oxygenator to estimate oxygen scarcity. And we first analyze the surface content and the current content, and we see that the Appetite from the cortic gold diorite and critical gold contonite, including the C. Jones trongemite and flavorous trongemite, the surf contents are generally below the detection limit. And uh, for the Clifford tonalite, tonalitic rocks, the sulfur values is above the de detection limit, but the generally is located in the low limit of the Phenozoic arc magmas. The magmas' uh, low value is, is generally here. And that has been compiled for the hub research in the last figures of the paper. And we have shown in the histogram. <clears throat> so we analyze the measure the surface species in the appetite. The primary appetite hosted by the zircon from the Cijon trongemite is the mainly sulfur 6 plus. And also, primary appetite from the Clifford stock is also mainly sulfur 6 plus. Compared to the primary appetite from the Clifford stock, the metamorphosed or alter appetites uh, generally have a low sulfur six plus over, over total sulfur ratio. So it may suggest that due to the metamorphic alteration, uh, the sulfur species has been like a uh, re reduced. So you can, it's quite interesting that from the zircon geochemistry data, the oxygen gasity for the c transmite is very low, but uh, the sulfur species in the appetite is a remaining surf sulfate. And that's because the previous study is suggesting that in the ions pores of trongemite, there's a sodium rich magma. The sulfur 
oh, sorry, the south fight to sulfur transition zones in FO2 space may move to a relatively reduced environment. So in relatively reduced like uh, state. So it may suggest that even in the relatively low oxygen scarcity, the sulfur in the appetite can still be so many sulfate. But anyway, we use a different oxygen parameter to make a, to estimate the oxygen scarcity and to make a summary here. And for the Clifford stock, the F2 value is about MQs plus 1.5. This range is similar to the Phenozoic arc magmas. And the Cody gold is formed at about F2 values of FMQ plus 7 and reference the FMQ0. So this is not similar to the connections unstable. What happened? It's not a common similar to the phenozoic arc magmas on the magmas associated with the phenozoic perfect carbon point. So we made some interpretation. We interpreted that the coated gold and cross out formed from mildly to moderately oxidized magma where voluminous early sulfur saturation was proper limit. But the limit limitation of the sorry the voluminous early sulfur saturation was limited uh, are different in the two cases. For the coated gold the early sulfur saturations probably limited by the least involved composition of the coated gold diorite. And the, for the cross out deposits, uh, the clear stock is limited by a very high oxygen. The state deposit may re represent a rare case where increased externally derived heavy seawater might have facilitated metal fertility in a relatively reduced magma chamber. That's an interpretation based on the acknowledge that Situation deposit form in the VM's camp, and uh, there is a low oxygen fugacity that suggesting the extensively high temperature alteration with the magma chamber. So we conclude the variable modes of formation for this deposit. In addition to the part two and part one, and uh, I would like to make some two include conclusion. The first is a similar metagenic processes for phenozoic porphyry carbon deposits operated at 1.88 billion years and also 2.7 million years. The rarity of the porphyry type of carbon gold deposit in Precambrian may be as a result of either local restriction of favorable metallogenic conditions and all preservation or exploration balances, and maybe also caused by some erosion loss. And this is the topic we will invest further. So this research, I would like to acknowledge many people from Laurentian University, University of Michigan, and with the university, including the grand baby. Uh, and uh, also I got many help from uh, the company, the labs, and uh, with their, without assistance, I may not be able to finish the research. And uh, particularly, I would like to thank to my supervisor, Jeremy Richards, who passed away in the 2019s in June because of the cancer. And uh, this is a photo we have taken in the hybrid deposit at the hybrid deposit in the south of Namibia in October uh, 2018. Yeah, thanks for this all my talk. I appreciate any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Young. That was uh, really fantastic. And uh, I think uh, a talk that certainly uh, honors Jeremy's memory as well. So well done, and particularly on your PhD yeah. and all that fantastic research. Um, do, we have any, do we have any uh, questions from the audience? Um, just to remind you while we're waiting for questions, if you want to ask a question, you can either type it into the chat or into the Q&A, or you can simply raise your hand like George Henry has just done, and we will unmute you when you can speak. So George, I'm going to allow you to talk and you can unmute. Thank you very much uh, for a fascinating talk, and I'm glad that uh, a lot more modern research work has been done, especially on the hard deposit. I was fortunate enough to visit it um, in 1981 um, and to actually uh, view it uh, and uh, to study the rocks and the core there as well. Um, it is uh, uh, one of the oldest porphyry deposits, I doubt it. Um, but I was just curious to know, um, I know that uh, people are busy exploring there and trying to make an economic deposit out of it. Um, but at, at present, uh, it is not being mined, but uh, I'm just curious to know what is the oldest 
dated porphyry deposit that is economically being mined at present anywhere in the world? Is it Precambrian? Is it um, uh, whatever the age is? Um, um, thank uh, you. Yeah, so so the porphyry, the oldest porphyry carbon deposit that have been mined, um, I think there is a porphyry deposit. Uh, yeah, I didn't visit the deposit, and it was in Australia, and uh, it's about formed about 2.7 billion years or 2.9 billion years. I think it's one of the oldest deposits. Um, and uh, later, I think the Cotego deposit, and uh, they have put into production. And uh, this is a good, rich porphyry car deposit, but it also contains a large volume, a large tonnage of the copper. And in the Cotego deposit, uh, nearby the Cotego deposit, they found a location that uh, contains much copper. And uh, they have the similar um, like uh, processes of the formation as Cody Gold. Um, Cody Gold will be put into production, I think. Uh, yeah, from the news I have uh, I have read. Uh, that's a two of the oldest deposits. I think that will be into production soon or have been in, into production. Okay, that's great. Thank you, George, and thank you for joining us. And then we have a question from Maxwell. Maxwell, I'm going to allow you to talk, and you just need to unmute. Maxwell, are you there? You just need to unmute. Looks like Maxwell has raised his hand, but uh, he's not able to... Oh, there we go, Max. We'll go for it. Uh, sorry, Grant. I think uh, I raised my hand by mistake. Okay, no just... problem. No problem. Yeah. Thank you for joining us, though. Okay. Sure. Uh, it's great to have you. All right. Do we have any other questions? Simply raise your hand or ask a question in the Q and A. Um, perhaps I can I can follow up with a question, Shu Young. Um, yep. You know, it's interesting. You say it looks like the mineralization process for these different aged porphyry deposits are similar to the, to the Phanerozoic. How do you think that gels with changes in possible geodynamic processes or tectonic processes, for instance, in arc environments over time? And I'm thinking about people like Mike Brown, <coughs> who think that there are significant changes in the, the delta P, delta T uh, variations in subduction zones from the Proterozoic to the Phanerozoic. Do you think the mineralization is unrelated to the tectonic mode or is there some kind of relationship there? Uh, yeah, from, uh, from, from the perspective of mineralization and uh, what we have found in this deposit, they are quite a similar like alteration, mineralization, such as type of uh, uh, products from the magmatic hydrothermal fluid that are quite related to the pressure and the temperature, as you mentioned, are quite a similar to what we have uh, identified in the Phenozoic deposit. Um, in, so the dirty P and dirty um, conditions uh, over the evolution of the Earth may affect the formation of the ILCG deposit that generally uh, are a sort to be related to such a thermal condition. And uh, from the per perspective of mineralization alteration, I do not see any difference of, uh, of these uh, factors with a uh, phenozoic perfect car deposit. Yeah. But okay. uh, uh, yeah, if uh, considering whether there's a tectonic dynamic setting and the relationship with a dynamic setting and perfect carbon formation, in a broader like uh, context, uh, they there may have uh, some relationship. Maybe uh, in earlier, maybe Precambrian is most like from the IOCG and in the Phenozoic form formed some uh, perfect deposits. And uh, Jeremy is mentioned this, but uh, it's a yeah, uh, it's it's a topic that I deserve for further investigation. I don't have. Uh, very absolute answer for this question. Yep. Yeah, no, I think it definitely deserves a lot more thought. 
Yeah, I think your, yeah. your work is very thought provoking in that regard. Uh, and Ray Durheim asks a very thought provoking question. He says in the Q and A, in your opinion, what is the chance of a hive type deposit under Karoo or Kalahari cover in Southern Africa? Okay. Oh, answered. Okay. So can you can you see the um, question? Yeah. Yeah, I I can see. Um, we I think we have a. Uh, during the field trip, we have uh, discussed this question, and uh, it's possible, but uh, because the cover are rarely thick, and uh, it's very hard for exploration, and uh, I think it is possible to find the high habitat deposit under the cover, but uh, it needs like uh, money to investigate, and it, it's a question that need that are very hard to test. Okay, great. Yeah, I think yeah, lots of possibility there. Uh, finding yeah, extensions of direct assault <laughs> would be a great thing to look for. Yeah, even even the whole high, but it's not mined now, and because of many reasons. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Very hard to get water there too. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, that's a one of the most important questions. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So um, I don't see. Oh, I see a question from. <laughs> Yes, Sharon, I'm going to allow you to talk and you can unmute. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, I, yep. Okay, um, yes, Sharon, uh, I have a, a question. You, you mentioned that the paucity of porphyry copper deposits in the Precambrian could be due to, um, you know, a, a lack of uh, survival. Uh, uh, They've all been eroded away, or you know, there, there could have been uh, maybe different tectonic settings and so on. Uh, most likely, it's the first reason that it's it's really because there are high level uh, things, and, and most Precambrian terrains have been highly eroded. You you really eroded away a lot of these uh, Precambrian, uh, uh, you know, Proterozoic and Archean um, porphyry copper deposits. Now, my question is this: if those Cambrian porphyry copper deposits would have existed in the past, but they've been eroded away. Now, the erosion products of those magmatic arcs that contain porphyry copper deposits will be sitting in sedimentary basins today. And we can look at zircons, um, you know, that are of paleoporozoic age that have come from paleoporozoic magmas. Now, you have shown us that you can look at zircons, and in, in those zircons, you can find magmatic inclusions of appetite, and you can analyze those appetites and get some information about oxygen fugacities in those magmas. So my yeah. question, could you identify from detrital zircon studies in sedimentary basins or Precambrian sedimentary basins, could you identify the former presence of mineralization, of porphyry type mineralization, just based on the kind of work that you've been doing on the appetites in zircons? Would that be able to to be possible to, to be do uh, to, to be done. Yeah, um, that's a very good question, and uh, this uh, topic I'm now thinking, and uh, I'm trying to ask for collaboration with some uh, research, and uh, the basic, like, uh, basically you can use a detrital zircon study, and uh, as well as the inclusion in the detrital zircon, to see whether the oxidized surface-rich magma forms extensively in the Precambrian or not. And uh, based on this research, you can say, okay, in the Precambrian, if they are extensively occurred, and uh, there is a possibility to form porphyry carbon deposit. And uh, this, uh, you can also compare these parameters with uh, phenozoic detrital zircon and have a uh, comparison and to see whether Precambrian or Phenozoic have a, most, uh, have a higher, which, which areas had a higher potential to form perfect carbon Yes, I, uh, my answer is uh, yes, you can do this, yeah. Thank you. Okay, well, I think uh, that brings us to the end of the questions. I don't see any more hands or questions in the Q&A. So, uh, Shu Yang, thank you very much again for especially staying up so late in Beijing time to talk to us. We really appreciate it. It must be close to midnight there. 
So uh, thank you very much for uh, being willing to talk to us. And certainly this is a very interesting talk. And um, I think there's a lot of uh, future collaboration that can be that can be done. So thank you very much, Ria. Yep. And um, yeah, thank you, Grant. Thank you, everyone. Thank, yeah. you, thank you very much. And just uh, to end off very quickly, as I always do, um, we'll, we will, of course, uh, advertise uh, the talk for next week fairly soon once it's confirmed. But just to remind you that uh, we currently uh, are on a fundraising drive to honor the memory of Matt Kitching, who worked in our school for 45 years. And if you are interested in contributing to a museum renovation to honor his memory and his hard work in the school, please just uh, take a picture of that QR code and you'll be led to a donations page and we'd be most appreciative of that. Right, that's all for us from the Geo Talk. So thank you once again. And uh, thank you to John Hancocks and CCIC for sponsoring this. And we'll be back next week at the same time and the same place. And we look forward to seeing you. All the best. <laughs>